Howdy, everybody. Um, as Alex said, I'm Daniel. I'm the founder and chief technology officer at Utility API. Um, we are a utility software and data access platform. Um, but I am also the maintainer of the LF Energy Customer or Carbon Data Specification Consortium's Customer Data Working Group, which I will go into. That's a very long name, and I'll go into how that structure works. Um, but we are focused on unlocking and standardizing access to real customer data. And so that involves a lot of privacy considerations. That involves a lot of um, authorization, customer consent, all of specifying and standardizing a lot of that to streamline, because customer data is the basis for um, so many different projects uh, for deploying clean energy technologies, for carbon accounting, et cetera, which I'll get into. Oh, OK. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I'm the founder and chief technology officer at Utility API. Uh, I'm the working group maintainer for the customer data working group. Um, so there are multiple working groups in the carbon data specification, uh, which we'll get into. And I'm the previous uh, vice chair of the board of the Green Button Alliance. I've been in this sector and working on customer data access for over a decade. Um, I've participated and contributed to a bunch of regulatory um, proceedings and technical working groups and stuff like that in the US and Canada. Um, I maintain multiple open source cybersecurity and privacy projects that are unrelated to energy, but still kind of on the topic of privacy and, and um, cybersecurity. And um, my, the, the company, uh, Utility API, has deployed the most certified Green Button Connect um, uh, platforms in the US. So we deal with authorizations, customer data, PII every single day, and thousands of third parties have used uh, Utility API to request and manage uh, downloading data from, from various utilities. So um, we have a lot of experience in the space. This is a topic of great importance to accelerating the energy transition and, uh, and unlocking the, the, I guess, the new energy economy, if you will. So a little bit about LF Energy structure. So the Linux Foundation is the top level. Then there is a division called LF Energy, and Alex is the executive director there. Then there is, a, there is kind of like two chunks of LF Energy. There is the chunk that is around open source projects. And so that's going to be software, that's going to be data research, et cetera. And then there is a chunk that is focused on specifications and open standards. And so that is called LF Energy Standards and Specifications. And so that's where we operate. Then within LFESS, or LF Energy uh, Standards and Specifications, there is a Carbon Data Specification Consortium. And so this is focused on um, specifications around carbon accounting or carbon impact technologies. And that has several, uh, several subgroups. Um, and there are two working groups within that. One is for customer data, and one is for power systems data. And so that's the, the chain of hierarchy, if you will, for where we're coming from and the organizational structure for, um, for the working group that I'm a part of. So uh, for customer data, we call that working group one. For power systems data, working group two. And so why did we divide up that way? Why did we set it up that way? We set it up that way. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Before we get to why we set it up that way, let's go to uh, why this matters. The fundamental questions that we are facing today, that we are hearing over and over and over again at both Utility API and in the market and in the policy world, are companies are saying, what are my carbon emissions and what can I do about them? So there's two parts to that. There's the part of what are my carbon emissions, right? We hear that with the SEC scope two stuff. We hear that with enterprises wanting to do, for example, 24 seven. These are all things where you have to know what your carbon emissions are. And secondarily, once I know that information, what are the actions I can take on it? Because rarely do you just say, yep, I see it. I'm not gonna do anything about it. Some companies may, 
But that's not the interest. That's not why you ask the question in the first place. You ask the question to get at what can I do about it. And secondarily, governments are, how can I speed things up? How can I go faster? How can I deploy things more? How can I get these initiatives out? How can I get them out the door? OK? And so these things are the main questions that this CDS, or Carbon Data Specification, is looking to address directly. So what goes into that? The calculation is there is an input of what is my energy usage. And there's an input of some sort of emissions factor. And you multiply them together, and you get the carbon impact. Now, obviously, it is very much more complicated than that, but those are the, that's the high-level kind of goals, right? The problem is, and this is actually something that I learned. I'm originally a chemical engineer um, from University of Texas at Austin, and the thing that they always teach you in chemical engineering is, in theory, reality and theory are the same. In reality, they're not. And so you have to actually look at if you're actually going to build an oil refinery that actually produces millions of like barrels of kerosene every day or gasoline or whatever, you actually have to figure out the reality. And the reality of this calculation is somewhat about what are the actual mechanics of the calculation, but also what are the mechanics of getting the data into the calculation in the first place. So the first one, energy usage, is really hard to get. And we're going to dive into that and how we're trying to specify stuff around that. The second part is the emissions factor is really hard to understand. It's really hard to figure out, oh, I'm at this location. How much is my carbon intensity right now if I'm buying power from the grid? What are my scope two emissions? So those two parts. Those are less about the theory and more about the reality. And how, if we're actually going to accomplish these goals, how do we address the reality? And so this is how the CDS working groups are split up. They're split into two separate working groups that work together. The first one is uh, the working group that I maintain, which is about customer data, how you actually get the real data for a customer to go into that calculation. The second is about how you get the power system data in order to multiply your usage against. OK? Any questions on that before I keep going? So that's how this is all set up. So let's talk about customer data. So the general premise that it's important to understand about customer data is getting customer data once is easy. You walk over to the customer's filing cabinet, you pull out the bills, you go back to your office, you type them into your spreadsheet, and you're done. Or you have an intern do that for you. And so getting it once is easy. Getting customer data at scale is hard. When you think about the amount of electric vehicle charging points that we need to install, when you think about how many companies need to like automate reporting their scope to emissions, when you think about all that sort of stuff, that has to happen millions of times. And you don't have millions of interns. So how do you actually scale up customer data access? That is the goal of this working group. So let's go through like what's actually hard about it. Let's understand the problem. First, nowadays, you need more data than what's just on the customer bill and the monthly kilowatt hours when you're doing things like EV charging, when you're doing things like demand response, when you're doing things like battery or uh, battery load management. You need interval data. That's AMI meters are rolling out all over. They're mostly everywhere now. They're all over Europe. And so you need a way to get that data. You can't just hand type in 35,000 data points for 15 minute intervals for a year's worth of data. You have to automate and create a standard around electronically transferring it. Second is, most customers have no idea how to get the data. Most customers have no idea what a kilowatt hour is. Like, I, the goal of this is to expand beyond the energy savvy companies, right? The Googles, the Microsofts. It's to expand to everybody because everybody has a contribution in the energy transition. Individual customer data is private and sensitive and requires consent to get. 
This is not synthetic data, although that is an incredibly good project for analysis, for modeling, et cetera. But when you're actually looking to install you know, EV charging points at a grocery store, you need that grocery store's energy usage in order to model that out. This is for actual deployments and actual measurements of actual companies. And so you need that customer's consent if you are a vendor or a, or a carbon accounting platform or something like that to do it. Um, the utility industry is fragmented. All this data sits in databases all over, right? It sits in here, it sits in Pepco's database. In Texas, in Austin, where I'm from, it sits in Austin Energy's database. There's no national database for this. In Europe, it's a little bit easier because it's the various different distribution companies that are more centralized. But still, that's not billing data. And oftentimes, you're doing analysis on a cost basis. You're not doing it on a kilowatt hour basis. And so you need these individual data points. So it's incredibly, the data set is incredibly fragmented. Data, uh, data formats are mostly ad hoc, so in line with the fragmentation. Utilities operate differently. They use different software platforms. They store data differently. A lot of times, for example, water is frequently paper-based. Like, it's incredible how many utilities, and McGee could probably um, say how many utilities, operate entirely in paper for municipal water utilities. It's crazy. And so this is a Goliath problem that has to be solved in order to scale the energy transition. Um, it's also hard to, like all these utilities, since they're in line with the fragmentation, it's hard for the utilities to, um, what, what utilities offer what data access? Which utilities are online? Which utilities are not online? Which utilities have different regulatory environments? That is all fragmented as well. So it's hard for a third party vendor, like a solar company or a Tesla or somebody to actually figure out what is offered where. Right? That's all on an individual basis. And many don't offer digital means of access. I can't tell you how many times before I started Utility API, I had to fill out a paper form and fax it into a utility in order to get the interval data. Like that happened. I had like in my early startup pitch decks, I had like a little photo of, <laughs> or a little scan of like the form I would fill out. Anyway. Um, in addition to that, those who do have some means of digital access, there are often huge barriers to getting into it. You have to register, you have to email the utility back and forth. The utility had just hired some vendor to do their digital access mechanism, and that vendor kind of was a contractor who didn't know what they were doing, and so you were really struggling to get connectivity and everything like that set up. So that's a, it's, it's very time consuming, it's very expensive, which means that you're, you know, startup app provider who wants to create an energy app that does X, Y, or Z, they have a huge capital expense that they have to do in order to actually get connected to the system. So your innovation is stymied by these barriers. Existing standards for digital access are proprietary. They're complex. They are major gaps. One of the reasons why this is at the Linux Foundation is because we are embracing an open standard. We are trying to be, make the standard as easily accessible and, 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 and widespread as possible, which is very beneficial. And regulatory oversight is highly complex because current specifications require expert knowledge. It is very in the weeds. So one of the goals that we are working on at um, this specification is making it easier for regulators and policymakers to just say, do that, and then insert sentence here, and that's all you need to do. Everything else is handled by the specification. One of the big problems with existing specifications is that there's a huge amount of optionality. There's a huge amount of like assumption. So one of the base assumptions that we do not hold, we do not um, consider this a valid assumption, is that the implementer of data access will be acting in good faith. Oftentimes, utilities resist um, regulators trying to require standards around data access for various reasons. Um, but that means that if they're told, yes, you must provide data access anyway, they're not particularly motivated to do it well. And so one of the goals of this specification is to write a specification that even if a implementer, a utility, or a central authority that is implementing this 
is passive, you still end up with a useful system that can be used at scale. Okay, so these are the things that we're, we're faced with, with the reality, not the theory, the reality of stuff. Okay, so a little bit about the working group. We have uh, active participants of some big names. I'm the uh, utility API is the maintainer. Um, we have four different use cases that we are trying to address um, with, these, with customer data access as our goals. Uh, carbon accounting is the primary use case. Obviously, it's carbon data specification. The second use case is decarbonization projects. That's that second half of that co uh, company question. What can I do about it? Customer data is often needed or usually needed in the majority of those deployment projects, especially for DERs, energy efficiency, building electrification. Um, the third one is distributed grid flexibility. So if you are doing program like demand response programs, if you're doing grid flexibility programs, grid management programs, virtual power plants, those generally need the vendors that are working with the individual customers to participate in those programs. They generally need data access in order to do true ups, to do sanity checks, all of that sort of stuff. And then the last one is building benchmarking. Many municipalities and states across the US are um, implementing requirements around Energy Star scores. Hey, how do you calculate your Energy Star score? You gotta get the building usage. How do you do that? Oftentimes, um, for example, one of the places that we have implemented data access is a municipal uh, utility in Colorado, Fort Collins Utilities. They have a 5,000 square foot threshold for their building benchmarking mandate. And like 5,000 square feet is like an Applebee's. So that is the threshold. And all the buildings, all the commercial and multifamily buildings above that threshold have to get their energy use. They have to get an energy star and they have to report it to the city. And so if that is going to be replicated across the country, it's not 50,000 square feet. It's not 20,000 square feet because, you know, 50,000 square feet, you probably have an energy manager. You probably have somebody who knows what a kilowatt hour is. 5,000 square feet, you definitely don't. And you definitely need customer consent because there's probably only one tenant. So at that point, it is very, very hard to scale without some sort of standardized access to data for building benchmarking. Okay, so let's talk about what goes into it. What goes into a scalable customer data access standard? So it's gonna take a while to get there, but you gotta hold on with me. So here we go. First off, you need discovery. As we talked about, some of the problems with data access and customer data access is that it's very fragmented. Specifying a way for vendors and companies to discover what kind of data access is there in the first place. So think of a search engine-ish. That is how you scale the ability to even know what data access is out there. Find what utilities are offering what data, how do you register for them, all that sort of stuff, right? Secondly, you need a way for vendors to register and connect with those utilities. Sometimes a region will go into a centralized data hub, like in the case of, for example, Texas, with their smart meter Texas. You need a way to be able to discover that that thing exists, and how do you connect with it? Because, as we saw before, some of the biggest problems are actually registering and connecting with these things in the first place, not the actual data transfer part. The third part is authorization. How you actually get that customer consent? Is it gonna be a paper form that you fax in? Is it gonna be some sort of online click-through authorization process? In spoilers, it is. And so, that is a part that needs to be specified because if that part is onerous, customers just aren't gonna click through it. You're not gonna be able to integrate it into your apps. You're not gonna be able to integrate it into your protocols because customers are just like, they're gonna fall off through that process. And the solution to that is not, is not, not requiring customer consent. The solution is streamlining the customer consent process because we have seen customer consent work very well in many other sectors. It is completely technically possible, right? You ever used a sign in with Google or sign in with Apple? 
That is an opt-in customer consent flow that is extremely smooth. So a lot of our specifications are modeled off of existing streamlined customer consent flows. And then the fourth one is around the data access itself. How is the usage data formatted? What are the APIs for it? All of that sort of stuff, okay? So those are the four components to a scalable customer data access standard. And we have started drafting, or we have drafts, for three different specifications. The first one is called server metadata, and that is the specification that says how do you, as a utility or a central entity, how do you advertise what it is you offer? And it's a structure for that, so that web crawlers, so that platforms that are doing carbon accounting or whatever, they can automatically just like poll various places, and as a utility or as a central authority starts to make data available or make capabilities available, they'll automatically pick that up. So it'll just start showing up. You don't have to go and ask each individual thousands of utilities. The second one is standardizing the actual registration. It's called client registration. So client, in this case, is the third party entity. And it could even be its own, like you could, if you are a large enterprise like Google or something like that, you could actually just register yourself if you want access, API access to your own data. Right? Or if you are a solar company or energy efficiency company or building electrification company looking to deploy things for GGRF or whatever, um, you'd be able to register, find registration pathways there. And it's a standardized protocol driven way of doing that. Oh. And the third one is the actual customer data piece. So what is the authorization scopes? How do you request authorization? What is the data formats itself? That's what we're going for, okay? And this is based off of a decade, over a decade, of living in this space and having lessons learned. And so these are the applications of the lessons learned that we've had, okay? Okay, oh, I already went through the specifications. So we're gonna dive into some of the features of these specifications, but before we do, does anybody have any questions around the um, organization of the specifications. Check time. Okay, we're doing good. Um, and these specifications, the drafts, are available at customerdata.carbondataspec.org. Um, at the end, I will do my little blurb about why you should join the mailing list and join us and comment and everything like that, but, uh, but that's where they're available as well. They're currently on just the maintainer's branch, which so my branch. Um, because we are still working through the consensus process um, for the rest of the year on getting things going. So when you go there, there's a link to the maintainers branch. Okay, so let's talk about what's awesome about this stuff. So the first thing is that it's not doing anything new. It is extending existing well-adopted technology standards that are used in finance, enterprise, uh, high-tech, all these other sectors, healthcare. It's piggybacking off of those standards and making them use case specific for the energy industry. So for example, server metadata is based on the well no dot well-known, like URL endpoints that is used by OAuth, that sort of thing. The client registration is based off of the OAuth standard, which is was invented by Twitter in like 2006, but is very, um, is very streamlined and used pretty much everywhere. It's basically the basis for most payment transactions in Europe nowadays, is like online payment transactions. So it's a very well-adopted um, base and so we're not doing anything new from a security or a privacy standpoint. Customer consent, that is all very well battle tested for almost two decades now of, of a base, which is highly beneficial for regulators who are looking for something safe. Um, it defines common use cases so that regulators only need to mandate 
specific use cases and do not have to get into the details. And so that's, I think I mentioned one of the problems before, this is a direct organization of these specifications tailoring to that. One of the lessons learned that we've had over the last decade is that in general data access doesn't happen without some sort of a mandate or some sort of a policy um, coordination. A utility is not just going to offer data access if nobody tells them to or if they don't work with the regulator because it is private information and utilities are very conservative. And so they're not going to want to give up customer data unless there is some sort of a connection and unless it's safe to do so. So this is basically streamlining the goal of these specifications is to make it easy for regulators to work with utilities to get something out the door quickly and not have to go into two years, I can't tell you how many years I've spent in technical working groups of a public utility commission considering something because it's, it's complicated. And so our goal here is to have some just like ready set stuff to go. Um, the next one, the benefit is it can be automated end to end. It's a completely API driven specification, meaning that there are no websites to actually register and connect. It's all API driven. And what that means is it can be integrated into other platforms. A carbon accounting platform can basically allow its user base to register and connect with utilities directly from that carbon accounting platform. Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability can offer benchmarking queries directly from Cloud for Sustainability to measure scope to emissions. So this is um, designed to be integrated and not be its own website. Okay. API-based account management allows for, you know, hey, I skipped ahead. So uh, one of the big things that we have found over our lessons learned is that things go wrong, right? When you have an AMI system, those are physical meters spread around town. Some meters break. Some meters get wrong data. Some meters, like you have maintenance. Right? You have trees falling on things. Things happen. This is the physical world we're dealing with. And so when those things happen, you need a way to communicate to the participants. If we're going to be in a connected, flexible grid, you need a way to communicate those happenings with the participants of that ecosystem. Right? And so if you have a demand, res ag demand response aggregator who has 1,000 homes, and five of those homes have bad meters at any given point, this specification, specification two, in this case, client registration and onboarding connectivity, has a way to communicate that outage information, that correction information. Hey, go re-download this data because it's now available. That sort of protocol is currently done by just email tickets, support tickets. This includes a specification around actually automating that so that you can do it at scale. So you can have two-way communication between external entities who are participating in your grid ecosystem, your virtual power plants, et cetera, and utilities who are operating those grids. Um, the customer data formats are extensive. It can support many energy transition use cases. I've listed off a lot of use cases that this is applicable to. Um, this is not the sexy part of those use cases. This is the just like mechanics of getting them going part. Um, but this is a very broad scale um, uh, application or API. Um, the last one, actually I don't know if this is the last one, but one of the ones is that this specification, these specifications are designed to be extended. They're, des they're encouraged for others to build their specifications off of them. And I'll get into that a little bit later on the um, use cases for the first and second specifications. But the third specification, if you have another data set that is niche to your particular region, say you have some sort of, uh, let's say, a net metering annual true up, and that's part of the regulatory policy, you can add those data fields, you can add that it's encouraged to add that as an extension of the customer data specification. 
So you can say, hey, I'm adding these sort of data fields. This is what's in it. And I'm just adding that as an extension. I'm not creating a whole new thing. I don't need to create a whole new API for it. So um, any questions on the high level features? I'm, uh, I'm not gonna go into actual like protocol level stuff although I would love to hang out with whoever next and, and talk about that. Um, but this is, so for example, OpenSynth, right? If you need to get bulk customer data from a utility to train your algorithm, et cetera, this, these specifications for connectivity, et cetera, they could be extended or used as the basis for establishing that connectivity and securely transferring that private information to researchers who qualify for it. Okay, so that's an example of a use case that can extend, be extended. Um, so here's what to know. Okay. Um, the first two specifications are not customer data specific. They standardize how third party vendors discover, register, and establish connectivity with utilities and other central entities. So these first two may be a it's, it's probably not a good to think of them as far as customer data specific, but energy ecosystem connectivity specific. So these are specifications where you can basically plop in and say, hey, if you are uh, doing some sort of curtailment protocol or something like that, some sort of super advanced meter um, connectivity, you can just say, hey, those entities who wanna participate in this program, we're just gonna have them do these first two specifications as far as the registration process, and that is done. You don't have to worry about registration and onboarding at that point, because you just use these two first two specifications. And the third one standardizes how third-party vendors can obtain customer authorization and access that private customer utility data. And again, this is not asking for any compromises to customer privacy because this is an entirely opt-in specification. Actually, it is entirely opt-in for individual customer data specification. Aggregated data is still possible to achieve if properly anonymized, okay? So we, we really didn't want to question the consent and the privacy standards that are already in place in Europe and the US and California and New York and other places around requiring customer consent because in, in our experience over the decade of doing this, customer consent is actually rarely the problem because the customer wants the thing. They want their Energy Star score. They want their you know, EV charging. They want the solar. They want the energy efficiency. They want the building electrification. They're a willing participant in all this. So sticking a form in front of them and saying, hey, I need your data in order to calculate this, that's easy to get. What's hard is the logistics of actually getting that form in front of them and getting the utility and uh, all of that sort of stuff. And so that's what we're focusing on here. So we're not questioning privacy. We are dealing in private data, but we, it's entirely a participant. The customer is a willing participant in all of this. Okay, so um, I, I briefly mentioned this before. The first two specifications are not specifically about customer data, so they can be used for many other grid connectivity, virtual power plants, grid participation. They can be used as the basis for bootstrapping those participations by vendors and third-party companies. Um, I'll just read the last sentence. By unblocking service provider registration and onboarding, we can accelerate the adoption of new innovative programs, grid flexibility, and deployment of clean energy technologies. I've been harping on that for a long time. And we're getting traction. Like, we have a widespread national platform at Utility API. We're doing this open standards initiative because we feel very um, uh, optimistic about our ability to really drive adoption of these standards so that we can unlock the new energy economy and make the energy transition that all of the policy initiatives go for. 
Okay, um, we have about nine minutes left. I have a series of use cases that I can go through in detail. I'm also open for questions as well, if there are any questions around these specifications. Before we do that, I wanna skip ahead in how to get involved. We need help. Um, we have regular working group meetings every other week. Everything is on GitHub, so you can go to GitHub and see the pull requests, which are the basically how we're reviewing our, our specification drafts. Um, it's all on customerdata.carbondataspec.org. Um, I would, my ask is that you join the mailing list because the mailing list is very low volume. It's basically just announcements of the working group stuff or when there's a new pull request or something like that. Um, so encourage you to join the mailing list. And if you are able to attend the working group meetings, all of the working group meeting minutes are posted online on the website and in the GitHub repository. And you can give feedback on the specif specification drafts. There is in order, so it's free to join the mailing list. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to like, and it's free. All of the information is available in the GitHub rep uh, repository and the website. So you don't have to actually agree to any terms and conditions in order to view any of that stuff. You can attend the working group meetings without having to join anything. If you do want your language added to the specifications, there is an agreement by the LFESS, the Linux, uh, LF Energy's standards and specifications, there is an agreement. You basically say that everything that I contribute here is free and like we're not gonna have royalties on it, that sort of thing. Um, so it's, it remains an open specification. Um, but that's just a DocuSign or I think it's now on the, it's now a Webflow or something. Um, but it's very easy to do and you don't have to do that to get started. You can just go and start attending and contributing that way. Um, and then when you say, I wanna add this, or I think that this needs to be changed, I can ask you to go ahead and go through that process to sign up. So it's really easy to get started. Super, um, super happy to broaden the pool of participants um, now that we have some drafts in play. So um, please, please visit the website and, and join the mailing list. Okay, any questions before I go through some use cases and wrap up? Yes. Great question. Um, so the question was, um, are there any concerns around data poisoning or data validation? And is that something the specifications need to address? So that is definitely a topic that we have seen before in other data access platform deployments. And the principle that we have kind of used in the past is that the data source that a utility should source the information from is the same data source that they show the customer. And so it's not necessarily from the AMI backend, it's from the ecosystem that they present to the customer for their information because the validation can occur in that case at the customer level. The customer can compare the utility bill um, versus their kilowatt hours that they see on the data access platform. Um, and so that is a very good consideration and we should totally, you should come to the working group and we can, we can see how we can add that. Um, this is one of those things where adding backend requirements for a utility to do is in that gray area of implementation direction versus standard of like what you have externally. And so that, that is kind of a balance on how to, how to manage that. Um, in general, what we would also encourage others to do in like our guidance documentation, that sort of thing, would be for the end users to validate against what they see from the customer as well, like spot check, that sort of thing. That's something that we, that we have encouraged people to do in the past with utility API, um, but that should totally be a part of the standard operating procedure for clients who are inter integrating with the system. So yeah, uh, another question? yes. So you mentioned the screen button. Yeah. And the, and the that. How does it compare, whether it's a compromise, something to do with video, whatever, how, what, how does it compare? 
Great question. So the, the question was, we mentioned green button. How does this compare with the green button specification? So there's a couple of things. Um, this is meant to be a um, meant to be a evolution of the green button specification. I was I've been in the green button. I'm still an active member of the OpenAD working group, and all, I'm we're like utility API still a sponsor member of the green button alliance, and we deploy green button certified systems. So that's like one of the parts of our business. Um, the main things. The vast majority of this document or these specifications cover things that are not covered by the green button specifications, namely the, um, let me go back to the, do, 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 mainly the discovery and registration. So those are not considered in scope. And then the authorization process, the user experience, the streamlined requirements, those are also not part of that specification. And that's actually one of the lessons learned when working on this specification is these are parts that we have seen industry, like utilities who have deployed this thing, really are lacking in their ability to effectively deploy something that is discoverable, something that is easy to register for. For example, um, the Illinois Commission required Green Button Connect, what, like a decade ago or something like that? I can't remember. It's, it's at least eight years ago. Required Green Button Connect. And to date, there have been, I think, one third party that's been able to get through the registration process and get connected with the utility ecosystems. And so if you can't get anybody through the process of connectivity, then you're not gonna have any adoption or like this is data access is an enabling thing for many different use cases. And so if you're blocking at the data access level, you're blocking all of those use cases that can derive value from it. And so these parts are going back to the theory, Green Button Connect is an is a very good standard around the last part, the the data access part. But even that has optionality, right? It assumes that the utility will be picking the data fields to make available that are actually useful, right? Everything, uh, so many parts of the green button standard are optional. And that just, we haven't seen that be effective for like just leaving it up to utilities to implement what they want. You have to be specific and you have to be uh, realistic about getting people into the system in the first place. And so I see it as these specifications are significantly broader in their scope and applicability than the existing green button specifications. It's entirely possible for green button, the existing specific or utilities that have deployed it, to implement the first parts of this and then just have that result be that you have a registration as a green button connect provider instead of a data access client here, or both. You can, both of these can run alongside each other. And so it's designed to do an easy transition for those utilities who have already deployed something that is green button. So for example, in Ontario, it would be, have the ability to basically go to the next level and keep the existing stuff in place. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm getting a thing that time is up, but happy to, Happy to continue to answer questions after the session or uh, as we go, but uh, thank you very much. Let me go to the last line. Do, do, do. How to contact me. Uh, join the mailing list, join the mailing list, join the mailing list. You can also email me, daniel at utilityapi.com. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>